Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees and on each episode I investigate a different, weird and wonderful subject and on this episode we are all going to set sail to explore the creepy, the eerie and at times downright macabre folklore surrounding three of Wales's best known rivers. Three waterways which are steeped in tales of giant serpents, tormented spirits, even a bottomless pit that leads straight down to hell, straight into the clutches of the evil one himself. Now, the folklore on this episode comes courtesy of one of my favourite and one of my most used folklorists on this podcast, I think, and that is the lovely, lovely Mary Trevelyan, who collected these tales in the early 1900s in the Edwardian period. And while we've looked at some of her folklore about water on previous episodes, we've looked at the folklore of the sea, the coastal folklore. We've also looked at the folklore more inland at the springs. This time we are turning our attention to the rivers. And we are going to start with a river which is not only the longest river in Wales, it's also the longest river in Great Britain. And that is the River Severn. The River Severn, which divides England and Wales in the south of the country, it flows down between the two countries out into the Bristol Channel. And it's the river most people visit in Wales or leaving Wales in the south will be familiar with because of the two seven bridges which connect the two lands via the motorways. But even more important than all of that is the folk tale attached to to the waters of the Severn. Quite an eerie little tale rooted in myths and legends and Trevelyan tells us that in several of the folk stories of Glamorgan, the Severn, the River Severn, is described as crying, wailing, moaning or groaning like a woman in sorrow, grief or physical agony which is one heck of a dramatic description of the sounds made by a river. The waters sound like a woman in some kind of pain, in some kind of agony. And up and down the Bristol Channel, skippers in the last half of the 18th century said that the apparition of a woman was seen swimming. So it's not just the sound, but the physical apparition of this woman, presumably the same one making those noises, has been seen swimming where the water flows out into the Bristol Channel. Sometimes seen trying vainly to reach land, or at other times gracefully swimming down the channel, or battling up the Severn Sea against the tide. And Trevelyan believes this tale can be traced back through the centuries to the tradition regarding King Lochrin. If I am pronouncing that correctly, I hope so, with Lochrin being the Cornish version of Lochrin Us, a legendary king of the Britons who Geoffrey of Monmouth, good old Geoffrey of Monmouth, wrote about in the 12th century. But we will refer to him as Lochrin on this episode because we are quoting from Trevelyan, who herself refers to him as King Lochrin. And she tells us that he was the eldest son of Brutus, who married Gwendolyn, the daughter of the Duke of Cornwall. And it was after a battle, after Lochrin had overthrown Humber, the king of the Huns, that he found an unexpected surprise hidden away on one of the enemy's ships. He discovered a woman, a woman described as, in inverted commas, a daughter of the king of Germany, who was very beautiful, and for some time Lochrin kept her in a subterranean dwelling near 
the seven. So to recap quickly, he's found this woman. He keeps her hidden away by the seven, presumably because he is married to Gwendolyn. And we are told that this charming lady bore him a daughter, which he also kept secret, unsurprisingly, and which he also kept in this subterranean dwelling. Now, there are slightly different variations of this story out there, and maybe I'll revisit some of the others in the future, but for the purposes of this episode, we'll stick to Trevelyan's version of events. And she tells us that during the Duke of Cornwall's lifetime, his father-in-law's lifetime, Gwendolyn's father's lifetime, Lochran, of course, kept this a secret. And if anyone asked why he was sneaking off to the Seven again? Well, he just said that he had a secret habitation he visited in order to worship his gods in private, which, as we know, that was the last thing he was thinking about. But when the Duke of Cornwall passed away, Lochran divorced Gwendolyn and came clean about the whole thing and made his mistress the new queen. Now, Gwendolyn was naturally a little bit upset about this, you could say. So upset, in fact, that she raised an army. She raised her own army against Lochrin, against her ex-husband, who was slain at the first encounter. And that taught him to go messing with Gwendolyn, because she didn't mess around. The very first battle, and he was gone. Lochrin was dead. And as for his new wife, the new queen, and their daughter, well, they were both captured. And more than that, this does not end well. More than that, they were both drowned in the seven. His new wife and the daughter they had in secret were drowned in the seven. And you might have noticed that I've avoided naming that daughter up until now for good reason so I can explain it at the end because her name in Cornish at least would have been Habren H-A-B-R-E-N but in the Welsh language she was known as Havren H-A-F-R-E-N but to the Romans she was known as Sabrina Sabrina is a name nowadays we might associate with a witch. But back then, Sabrina was more associated with being a goddess. A goddess of the river. In fact, there was an edict issued that the river should bear her name. And the River Severn, now in English, is indeed named after Sabrina Habren, Havren, the goddess of the river who has been heard wailing in pain and agony at all times of day and night, and has even been seen swimming up and down the Bristol Channel. And on that cheerful note, let us move on to another famous Welsh river. And for this one, we are going to head west ever so slightly towards the capital city, towards Cardiff, towards Cardiff, and we are heading towards the River Taff, where we are told a whirlpool forms a small lake when the bed is almost dry. And in the days of old, this was a whirlpool of some renown, because it was known far and wide as one of the seven wonders of Glamorgan. And people said that it was fathomless, which is a word I don't think I've used on this podcast before. It was fathomless, bottomless, and in its cavernous depths, a monstrous serpent dwelt and gorged on the unfortunate victims that were drowned in the river and sucked into the whirlpool. And I think this is one of those examples where folklore does touch on some real-life tragedies if people did go missing in or around this area and they couldn't explain where the bodies had gone. 
well, maybe it was this this giant serpent, because as Trevelyan continues, she says when any bodies were not recovered from this whirlpool, people said they had been swallowed by the serpent, and agonies of torture possessed the minds of those whose relatives were so ill-fated. But when a body came to the surface, it was thought that the person was very good because the serpent would not touch the corpse of the righteous. And this really is at the darker end of folklore now, so I won't dwell too long on it, but it's this idea of of trying to find some kind of comfort in the bleakest of situations and just the fact of having a body at least that suggests they were a good person. But back to the whirlpool itself. And there was an old woman who was fond of telling nursery stories related to her by her grandmother who said that the Taff whirlpool was frequented by a lovely lady. So we've moved on from that giant monstrous serpent, but frequented by a lovely lady who lured people whilst bathing. Youths were known to swim or row towards her, attracted by her beauty. They were then sucked into the vortex and their bodies could never be found. The old woman said that this lovely lady was, in fact, the devil in disguise. And to quote that old lady, to quote the narrator, she tells us that it is a dreadful winch. Not a witch, W-I-N-C-H. It is a dreadful winch and it is fathomless. The second time I've had a chance to use that word now. It is fathomless, it is bottomless, and it reaches from the taff to the mouth of perdition, where Satan waits for the souls who are beguiled by the lovely lady. Which is one heck of an image, isn't it? Swimmers, innocent, naive swimmers in Cardiff, allured towards this lovely lady and towards this winch which leads them straight to hell. And they go down, so far down, that Satan is waiting at the bottom for them. And Trevelyan does tell us in a footnote that this isn't a one-off. By all accounts, this idea of a winch being a danger in the water, well, more, more than an idea, it was a danger, was also prevalent in Nash Sands, another popular area for certainly for seafaring folklore and for witchy folklore actually as we've had on a previous episode but we are told that in Nash Sands in modern day Vale of Glamorgan there's a winch into which ships are drawn and the Nash Passage which is locally known as the Great Gutter contains a winch which at high tide is very dangerous and swimmers are warned against it. And another example can be found just down the road in Bridgend, in Kenfig Pool, near Porth Call, which is supposed to contain a winch as well. And to wrap up this little section on winches, something else I never thought I'd say on this podcast, but to wrap up this little winches part, Trevelyan does tell us they were a popular feature elsewhere as well. And they did lead to a saying, to quite a Welsh saying, I believe, and that was, sly and underhanded people are commonly described in Wales as being as deep as a winch. If you really want to insult somebody who is sly and underhanded, just say they are as deep as a winch. And on that note, let us move on to our third And final river, and for this one, we are heading north to another river which divides Wales and England, and that is the River Dee. And the River Dee was supposed to be very sacred, Trevelyan tells us, which makes a nice change, doesn't it, already after these tales of serpents and tragedy and drowning and devil women and pits to hell. But this sacred river rises from two springs, we are told, 
near a farmhouse called Pant Gween near Dolgetlai, and it is asserted it passes through Bala Lake without mixing its waters with those of the lake. Now, Bala Lake Llinteged, very famous for the Avanc monster, which is said to lurk within, and which is something we will definitely be looking at in the future. And when we do, you can remember that the River Dee is supposed to pass through it without mixing any of its waters. Magic, I tell you, magic. Now, beyond Chester, it runs into the Irish Channel, and this river is supposed to derive its name not from D, as in black in Welsh, or Dui, as in two and as in the Welsh name, but from Du. D U W. Du. Divine. A heavenly, godlike river. It truly is sacred, if, of course, you believe Trevelyan's explanation of the name. And she tells us there is an interesting story connected with the Rudai, a spacious meadow near the D at Chester. Now, as far as I know, the Rudai, which is on the banks of the Chester nowadays, is a racecourse. And so, presumably, we are talking about the same place. And she tells us that this ground was, ages ago, flooded by the tides in the D. But a bank, or I of land in the centre remained above high water mark. On this piece of ground, a plain and substantial stone cross formerly stood. It acquired the name of Rudai, or Island of the Cross. So if you're following this, the river burst its banks and it cut off a little piece of land upon which was a cross. And as a result, it became known as the Island of the Cross, which is what Rudai means. And tradition asserts that at one time, drought was intolerable in the neighbourhood. Never mind bursting its banks and flooding and cutting off islands. It was the opposite. The people were desperate for water. And we are told that back on the Welsh side of this England-Wales watery divide, back in the Church of Harden in Flint, a cross and image of the Virgin Mary stood, and to this shrine of the Holy Rood, people of all classes went to pray for much-needed rain. And in particular, the wife of the governor, no name sadly, but the wife of the governor and lord of Harden prayed so fervently and continuously that the image fell upon her and caused her death. Which, talk about having the opposite effect. You are praying fervently. You are praying to the Virgin Mary to bring water and to extend everyone's lives. And instead... Your life is cut short, and I'm sure there is some symbolism amongst all of this somewhere, which I won't dwell on now. But she was killed as a result, and so angry were the inhabitants with this answer to their prayers that they selected a jury to sit in judgment. And the verdict of this jury was willful murder against the image of the Virgin Mary. So if you're keeping track of this, because it is a little bit unusual, especially for such a strong, fervent, God-fearing Christian country as Wales, but they've put the image of the Virgin Mary on trial for murder, and they have found it guilty, and as a result, as punishment, they determined to lay the offender on the beach at low water, whence the next tide carried it to a spot under the walls of Chester. So it's been washed away from Flint to Chester, from Wales to England, and it is asserted that the citizens of Chester held an inquest and, seeing that the object was the image, decided upon burying her where she was found. So the Virgin Mary washed up in Chester, the good people of Chester decided they should just bury her, where, well, her, it, bury it where it was found. And they erected 
a cross over her grave. And that was the end of that. Although there is an alternative version, another version which affirms that the image instead was carried to St. John's Church and there set up and the crucifix was placed upon the Rudai. So, whichever version you choose to believe, that is how the cross ended up on the Rudai. Now, to wrap up our look at the folklore of the River Dee and our little trip over the border to Chester, we are told that near the banks of the Dee in Chester are the Wishing Steps and the folk story attached to these Wishing Steps is that whoever stands at the foot of these steps and wishes for anything and runs up to the top and down to the bottom without taking a breath will have their desires fulfilled and is there any truth in that i don't know maybe maybe you've tried it maybe you've been to chester maybe you live in chester and you have indeed run up and down without taking a breath if not maybe you'd like to try it and if you do it would be lovely to hear from you as always if anyone wants to get in touch about running up and down those magical steps or for any other reason i'm quite easy to find online i'm quite easy to find on the main social media channels and as mentioned this is just our latest look at some watery folklore from mary trevelyan the last one was a few months ago back on episode 54 and if you don't want to miss the next one or any of the wonderful episodes coming your way be sure to hit the subscribe button and you will never miss an episode ever and on that note it just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening Dioch and Varian am grando I've been Mark Reese this has been my ghosts and folklore podcast it's the best, it's the beautiful, it's the only Ghosts and Folklore podcast beaming to you from Wales to the world. Until next time, no star.